Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our, our virtual science behind. My name is Scott Dunn, my pronouns are he, his, and I am one of our community programs coordinators here at Walking Mountain Science Center. And we're excited to be bringing this to you this evening. It's been about a year since we've been able to do a Science Behind program. And traditionally, if you are a regular at our Science Behind program, they are a longer format lecture and workshop combination evening. And although these virtual offerings will be a little shorter, roughly 30 to 45 minutes, we're hoping that they provide you with some tools to uh, experiment with some new things uh, at home. And hopefully, knock on wood, come summer, we'll be able to uh, meet together in person again for our more traditional programs. Uh, as I've mentioned uh, before, the Q&A and chat functions of Zoom is how we will reach out to Hannah, our presenter this evening. Uh, Hannah will join us live after the presentation to discuss any questions and additional information. Um, so feel free to ask um, throughout the presentation or you can share them till that um, question and answer period at the end. Um, but if there aren't any other questions and everyone can hear me all right, um, we will get started with the presentation. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah Rumble. I'm the Community Programs Director at Walking Mountain Science Center. And I became interested in lotions and balms as a, as a way to control what chemicals I put on my body and because it's really fun. Like most people in the mountains, I deal with dry skin and want to share the research I've done about it. This is the fourth time we've presented on this topic because it's been a really popular topic for the Science Behind series. And we thought that while people are socially distancing, we could use this time as an opportunity to do more DIY projects. So here we go. As far as we know, humans have always used products on their skin for healing, soothing, and, and cosmetics. There's evidence of people rubbing plant oils on their skin since 10,000 BC, and archaeologists have uncovered many pottery jars and tombs filled with animal fats, olive oils, and herbs that were used cosmetically. Historically, lotions and balms were made from the resources available locally. So in Latin America, people used things like avocado oil, olive oil, was used in ancient Greece and Europe, and animal fats were and still are in some cases used in North America. As time went on, the ingredients used in moisturizers became more complex and globally produced. By the late 19th century, after petroleum was discovered in Pennsylvania, lotions and moisturizers were being mass produced with ingredients such as petroleum jelly, mineral oil, and lanolin. Today, they come in a dizzying array of styles, smells, and special ingredients. For the most part, they work by adding water to the skin and adding a coating to keep moisture in. Before we get to the topic of homemade lotions and balms and how they work, we should first know more about our skin and what causes it to dry out. So the skin and its appendages, such as hair and nails, make up the integumentary system. The word integumentary comes from Latin, meaning to cover, and that is the skin's main purpose, to keep the world out and our internal organs protected. It is the largest of all of our organs. Additionally, the skin helps regulate body temperature, protects our bodies from the sun and other environmental factors, synthesizes vitamin D, excretes waste products, and of course is the organ of touch. The epidermis is the upper layer of skin and is very thin but contains multiple strata. It doesn't contain any blood vessels, but this is the location where skin cells called corneocytes are produced and where water loss from the body is regulated. The very outermost layer of the epidermis is called the stratum corneum and it is made of dead skin cells. So this outermost layer is the skin we can see and touch. We shed 30 to 40,000 of these dead skin cells per minute. Lower down in the basal layer of the epidermis, 
new skin cells are pushed up to replace dead skin. As they are pushed upward, they become flattened and deformed and die. It takes 28 to 30 days for a new skin cell to push through the five strata of the epidermis to reach the stratum corneum. If you think of these skin cells as bricks, there, there are also waxy substances or lipids on the surface that serve like the mortar to hold the bricks in place. They are oil loving and water hating, but when overloaded with water, the dead skin cells puff up, causing that wrinkled look when you spend too much time in the bathtub. The dermis is the middle layer of the skin. It is connected to the blood and lymph supply of the body and contains hair follicles and sweat glands. In this layer, sebaceous glands are connected to hair follicles, which create sebum, which combines with sweat to produce an acid called the mantle, an antibacterial shield and moisturizer for the surface of our skin. The mantle makes our skin an acidic 4.5 to 5.6 pH, protect, protecting the body from bad pathogens that tend to like a more alkaline surface or a higher pH. The hypodermis is also called subcutaneous tissue and is the layer of fat in our bodies. It contains the roots of oil and sweat glands and has larger blood vessels and nerves than the dermis layer. The fat isn't just an energy reserve, but it also acts as an important insulation and padding for the body. This is the lowermost of the three main layers of skin. When we talk about the skin in terms of dryness or appearance, we are normally concerned with the topmost layer, the epidermis. So now let's get into the good stuff, what dry skin is and what we can do about it. Remember that the skin cells on the outermost layer of skin are actually dead and are being shed and replaced by new dead cells constantly. Although they are dead, a healthy surface has cells that contain 20 to 30% water. Anytime the percentage of water in these cells gets to 10% or lower, dermatologists call this dry skin. Normally, these cells take up the same surface area as the layer of living cells in lower strata, but when they dry out, they reduce to one third or less of, the, of their normal size. And so the stratum corneum layer becomes smaller and feels tighter than the strata below. As it tightens, it cracks, resulting in the flaky or scaly appearance we know as dry skin. So the stratum corneum is always losing water through evaporation, and evaporation causes both water and the natural oils to leave your skin. When you lose the oils, you're further losing the ability of your skin to seal in water. Both hot and cold weather cause evaporation from your skin, so the more extreme on either end, the more water we tend to lose. We live in a very low humidity environment here in the Rockies, so this further adds to our dry skin woes. Heaters tend to dry the air further, and hot showers are also a major culprit for people's dry skin. While it may seem counterintuitive, when we take hot showers or baths, hot water evaporates more quickly from the skin than cool or lukewarm water. The more internal causes of dry skin include being dehydrated, so it's important to drink plenty of water and to avoid drinking too much caffeine or alcohol, which contributes to dehydration. As we age, we produce less sebum, which are the natural oils that help seal in water, and dry skin can also be hereditary. Now I'd like to share with you some everyday tips that are proven to help prevent dry skin. A big one has to do with our bathing habits. Though long hot showers can feel luxurious in the moment, if you can take shorter lukewarm showers, your skin and our environment will thank you. Avoid harsh soaps that strip away the oils in your skin or change the pH of the mantle. 
A good way to know if your soaps are too harsh is if you are left with the tight, squeaky clean feeling. That is not a healthy feeling. I also recommend avoiding exfoliating scrubs because these also tend to strip away the oils we need to seal in water. If you do exfoliate, do so gently and moisturize immediately after you exfoliate or get out of the bath. If you can get in the habit of showering less often, your body will normally adjust and you will also have healthier skin. Other tips for avo avoiding dry skin include using gentle, non-abrasive laundry products and skin products. When you're going to face extreme heat or cold, keep your skin covered to reduce evaporation, but tight clothes like skinny jeans can be abrasive too. Use a hum humidifier or an essential oil diffuser if you want to add an aromatherapy element to add humidity to your home, and of course, drink lots of water. While we can take many steps to help prevent dry skin, it's likely that for many people, it's going to be inevitable from time to time. So when we talk about lotions and moisturizers, there are different categories of ingredients that are in different skincare products. One of these categories is occlusives. Occlusives are greasy substances that hold in water that is already in or has been added to the skin. An extremely effective one is petroleum jelly, but there are also a lot of environmental concerns with the manufacturing of these fossil fuel-based products and for getting chemicals such as benzene absorbed in the bloodstream. Humectants are another common moisturizer ingredient that force water into the epidermis by drying it up from the dermis. If it's humid enough, Humectants can also draw water from the air into the skin. Humectic, humectant ingredients you may see include amino acids such as urea, sugar alcohols such as glycerol and sorbitol, honey, molasses, eggs, aloe vera gel, ceramides, alpha hydroxy acids such as lactic acid, glycerin, and hyaluronic acid. Glycerin and hyaluronic acid are two of the more common, commonly used humectants in skincare. And then emollients are ingredients that help to fill in gaps used or created by skin tightness so that your skin feels smoother and more comfortable. Common emollients include lipids and oils, colloidal oatmeal, shea butter, and isopropyl palmitate. Since they tend to be oil-based, they often do double duty as occlusives that hold in moisture. Now I want to talk a little bit about specific ingredients and many mass-produced products available in stores today. Americans use an average of six to 12 different products on their skin each day, from lotion to shaving cream, shampoo to soap, and makeup to skin cleansers. This means that we could be putting around 126 unique ingredients on our skin each day. Some of these ingredients are either known or suspected carcinogens or are suspected to be toxic in other ways. Our bodies do a really good job blocking and filtering out toxins but with so much exposure, it's possible that toxins can build up to levels that our systems can no longer metabolize. The FDA has no authority to require companies to test cosmetic products for safety. The FDA conducts pre-market reviews only of certain cosmetic color additives and active ingredients that are also classified as over-the-counter drugs. The FDA has banned 11 ingredients in cosmetics, but the European Union has banned more than 1,000 ingredients over health and safety concerns.
These are some of the concerning ingredients in contemporary mass-produced products. Parabens are known to disrupt the endocrine system and are linked to bre breast cancer. Benzene is often in fragrances and is linked to many types of cancer. Ingredients set listed as fragrance can be any number of 5,000 chemicals, meaning the specific ingredient doesn't have to be listed on products. So the next, port, the next portion of the, the presentation will be about how to make your own lotion bars at home. So why make your own? In addition to being in control of the ingredients that go into your products, you can control other aspects like the shape and smell of your products. You can avoid allergens if you have sensitive skin, save money by buying ingredients in bulk. You're also going to reduce your use of single-use plastics and the number of containers that end up in the landfill. And it's super fun. These are the resources used for the presentation if you want to explore further. Next, I'm going to play a video about the process of making your own customizable lotion bars at home. Afterward, we will come back as a group and answer any questions you may have. And as a reminder, we will email all webinar participants the link and recipe after tonight's Science Behind. First, gather all of the ingredients so you have them in one place. This lotion bar recipe uses three simple ingredients of coconut oil, shea butter, and beeswax. You can also add vitamin E oil for added skin benefits, and it also acts as a preservative. For the scent, you will want to use your favorite essential oil or a combination of essential oils. We decided to experiment mixing orange and lavender here. For the supplies, you will need a silicone mold to shape the lotion bars, measuring cups, something to stir with such as a Pyrex cup with a spout to pour the mixture, a double boiler, and a stove. Some people like to use a large mason jar sitting in a pan of shallow water as their double boiler so they don't have to worry about cleaning out greasy bowls or pans afterward. What I like about this recipe is that it's the same amount of each ingredient, so if you have a lot of molds to fill or only a few, it's easy to make more or less than what the recipe says. Beeswax takes the longest to melt, so I added that first, but the order doesn't matter. I use beeswax pastilles because they're easier to measure and melt faster than blocks of beeswax. Shea butter can also help treat eczema and minor burns and can also help to prevent sunburn. Coconut oil can accelerate skin healing and collagen repair and is naturally antibacterial and antifungal. While the lotion bar ingredients melt, make sure you stir them regularly, but also make sure your molds are ready and essential oils are opened. When this liquid is removed from heat, it sets quickly, so you should be prepared to do the next steps. Stir until everything is completely melted and carefully pour the liquid into your pouring device. Next, add your optional essential oils and vitamin E and stir. 12 to 25 drops per three cups of liquid is usually adequate, but you can decide what you like. Pour the mixture right into the molds. You can see in this picture that they sit quickly from the bottom, which is why you need to move quickly. If the liquid sets inside your pouring device, you can always put it back into the double boiler to melt again. Heat isn't ideal for the essential oils, but it won't ruin your lotion bars. If you put your lotion bars in the fridge, they will completely set in 10 minutes or less. When they are hard to the touch, you can pop them out. If you think they're too hard and waxy, you can use a little less beeswax the next time. If they're too soft or greasy, use more beeswax. To use them, just rub them between your hands so your body temperature melts them a little. You can get creative with your lotion bar shapes. You can find a huge variety of silicone mold sizes and patterns on the internet, or you can pour the mixture straight into old containers like mint tins. We will email everyone a handout with several lotions and balms recipes. Have fun with it! All right. So after that little presentation, I'd like to invite Hannah to join us here. So Hannah is going to field our questions and also has some more information to share with us all regarding uh, lotions and making your own at home. So welcome, Hannah. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? 
Yeah. Perfect. All right. Um, so it's, we got one question from Rachel. Um, if you have any more, feel free to type them into the chat or into the Q&A section. I'll check them both. Um, but Rachel asks, does extra hand sanitizer use contribute to dry skin? Um, very timely question. We're, we're using a lot of that right now. And the answer is yes, unfortunately. A lot of you have probably noticed that it does tend to dry out your skin. Uh, that's because the main ingredient in hand sanitizer is alcohol and alcohol evaporates really quickly. So it has the same effect as hot water does as on your skin. When it evaporates quickly, it'll, um, it'll cause the moisture in your skin cells to, um, to evaporate quickly as well. So um, I purposely didn't include anything about hand washing in the, in the tips because I don't want anyone to wash their hands any less, especially these days. But um, I do recommend as soon as the, the rubbing alcohol or you know, the hand sanitizer is dry on your skin, just put some lotion on, some moisturizer, whatever you have as soon as it's dry. And then you know, you know your hands are clean, but then you can, you can moisturize to help replenish some of that. And unfortunately, that's just something we all are probably dealing with right now. And then I did want to um, add a, a few notes in there, things that I didn't include in the tutorial about the lotion bars. Um, one is that with the lotion bars, they're really simple and easy to make, but um, they, they tend to melt pretty quickly because they melt with your body temperature. So a good way to store them is um, just simply with parchment paper or wax paper, something along those lines, and then some masking tape. Um, if you're not using an actual container to put them in, you're, you're making a, a solid, you know, separate bar. Um, and then try to remember not to keep them in somewhere where it would be really sad if it melted. Um, so, um, and, uh, you know, don't keep it in your hot car in your console in the summertime. I do you tend to keep some in my console in the wintertime, but make sure that goes away when temperatures get higher. Um, same thing, like don't put them in your purse if you think your purse might get hot and you don't want things melting everywhere. Um, so just be aware of where you're using it and where you're storing it. And then um, another thing to point out is that I talk about coconut oil and we showed it a little bit, but um, in that recipe, it's specifically the, um, the coconut oil that you would normally find in, in your grocery store. So that means that it, it's a solid um, went in room temperature. So it's the solid white stuff that you'll see in the jar. There is another version of coconut oil you can buy that's usually meant, um, usually with skincare products um, at specialty stores, and I've, I've got some with me. Um, it is called uh, fractionated coconut oil, um, or sometimes just referred to as like liquid coconut oil. And as you can see here, it looks kind of just like some clear water in it. So that means that it's, it's been um, processed so that it is a liquid at room temperature rather than a solid. So as you explore and try out new recipes and making things at home, make sure um, you're using if, if you're using the right type of coconut oil. If it specifically calls for fractionated coconut oil or liquid coconut oil, that's because it they don't want the um, the end product to set at room temperature. They want it to remain a liquid. So that's a key thing I wanted to point out there, and. Um, so we talked about storing things. So, um, so we've got another question here. It looks like. Yeah, so um, Dan, Dan's asking uh, if you have any recommendations for any over-the-counter products that would kind of yeah. match what we're making or be a, perhaps a similar recipe. Yeah, I mean, on, to be honest, I don't really have any favorites when I do buy them. I, I'm always experimenting. And for me personally, I'm really into scents and aromas. So I tend to go by smell because th these days there, there tends not to be a lot of difference between over-the-counter products that you can buy. There's, 
differences in the types of ingredients that are in them or how they're processed or if they're organic ingredients um, or include palm oil or, you know, palm oil free. But really, you can't really go wrong just finding a product that you like and that works for you and that you're going to use. So, you know, if you if some people like a greasier, thicker product and some people don't like that, they want it, they don't want to really feel it on their skin. They want it to soak in right away. So it's kind of personal preference. So I'm sorry, that's kind of kind of a cop out answer for you, but I tend I don't stick with any personal. I don't I'm not a, a brand loyal person. So I I like to try new scents and see what see what I like. Does anyone else have any questions? And then um, I did also want to mention I didn't talk very much about um, essential oils in there, but you can get really, really kind of crazy with it. I've gotten, I already mentioned that I really like scents. So I've gone a little bit crazy with the essential oils at home. I have many, many different scent options, but um, uh, be a little bit aware that there's, on the internet these days, there's, there's a lot of sort of untested um, health claims associated with essential oils. And so with um, all kinds of things that, you know, like take this and, and put these drops in your drink for whatever purpose. Um, and a lot of that really isn't very, isn't, isn't tested, hasn't been thoroughly tested. Um, and you wanna be careful because a lot of essential oils are not intended to be ingested. They're really um, the primary benefit that actually does have proof behind it is the, the aromatherapy and mood benefits. You know, there are different scents that can be calming and relaxing. Some can help you um, get, you know, think more clearly because it kind of helps pep you up. And there is um, evidence with that, but there are other health claims that are really just be a little bit aware of that as you read different articles about essential oils and recipes. Um, we got, so there's another question that says, is, if it said, if a label says natural fragrance, is it healthy? Um, I think, unfortunately, there's no way to know that unless they tell you what the fragrance is made from. A lot of companies these days have, are choosing to say where, where the fragrance is coming from, but if you call it fragrance, it neither natural nor fragrance is very moderated. So I'm, I'm not sure, I, I can't give you a good answer there. Um, I would say, you know, reach out to the company and say like, what act, what is, what's in your natural fragrance? What does that mean? What are the ingredients? Um, I think as consumers, um, it, you know, it's great for us to speak out and really kind of demand to know what's in the products we use. And then Hannah, we got another question. Um, is there a benefit to applying moisturizer to damp skin versus dry skin? Um, yes. Um, in some, in a lot of cases, if you're using that occlusive that I, I spoke about earlier, if it's something that's got that, um, Vaseline type texture or the waxy texture in it, it can help seal moisture in. But um, when it's thin, when it is a thinner lotion, it might just kind of move it around. Um, uh, but yes, usually when your skin is a little bit damp, it's that's the best time to add a, a lotion or a balm to your skin. Um, like right after a shower is a great time to help um, seal any water um, at the, at the surface. Great. If there are any other questions here, feel free to add them into the, the chat or the Q and A. Uh, but I did want to reiterate that for all those attending, we'll, you will get a follow-up email with a PDF of some recipes to try this stuff out at home. Also, if you want to go back uh, to this presentation as a reference, it will be posted online on Walking Mountains' YouTube channel in the coming days. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. You can share it with your friends and all that good stuff. 
Um, but if there aren't any other questions, I just want to thank Hannah for joining us this evening. I'd also like to say that we're going to do this again come March. On March 17th, we're going to do another virtual Science Behind. We're going to be focusing on seed starting with Lindsey Graves of uh, Four Street Farms down at Eagle. So we're going to be talking all about how to get your vegetable garden started early and healthily inside um, while the snow's still on the ground. And so in a, in a very similar format to this, uh, I invite you all to join us on the 17th. Uh, we know it's St. Patrick's Day, but uh, hopefully you'll carve out a little time for your vegetables. Um, and uh, we appreciate all of you joining us. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out to myself or Hannah. We're here at Walkie Mountains all the time. So uh, with that being said, have a great night, everyone. And we hope to see you again for future programs. Thanks for joining us, everyone.